Welcome to the Modern CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping accounting firms achieve success. If you're an accounting firm owner who wants to learn how to grow your firm by providing virtual CFO services, then this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. I'm very excited for today's topic. It is a topic that is pretty much relevant any time of year, any um, any year. Um, we're always um, we're always thinking about changes, and so today we're bringing in um, Douglas Ferguson from uh, Voltage Control, who knows a lot about change and works a lot of with companies on change. So, welcome to the show, Douglas, and would love for you to um, give a little bit of introduction about your background and your company. Yeah, for sure. Um, well. As Jamie mentioned, I'm founder of Voltage Control, and we're a change agency, which means that we help organizations navigate change and, and actually thrive through change. A lot of times folks see change as something that's like, oh, we had to wade through it, or it can be so um, so much of a struggle just to be stuck in that messy middle. It's going to be frustrating and difficult. And I, we believe it can be a time to thrive. And especially in, in these uh, in the, these uncertain times we're in, change just begets more change. It begets more change, right? And so, how do we look at it as something that we, where we can thrive? And so, we we help people navigate those moments and also build the skills that it takes to look at future changes without with less fear. Awesome. In addition to Douglas, we have uh, Jody here. So, Jody, uh, welcome to the show again. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Gene. And I, I know you're someone who uh, who loves change and strives for change and is always thinking about change. So I'm excited to have you have you on the show. And I'm going to actually let you give uh, Douglas the first question because I've worked with you long enough to know uh, change is your thing. So. <laughs> yeah, so so obviously you can't be afraid of change, right? So change has got to be something you've got to be able to embrace. And, you know, with, with a lot of people, you know, that's just not the case. You know, change is something that they kind of hide from. They kind of, you know, push off. You know, and, and there's tons of excuses or reasons why uh, they, they don't want to make change. And so, you know, with that, you know, how, what, what's a healthy middle? Because obviously you don't want to make change for just to make change. You know, that doesn't make sense either. But you want to make reasonable change. And so how would you feel like a healthy medium of a person with change, you know, dealing with change? You know, I think a lot of it has to be start it through exploration because if we don't start with a, a mindset around exploration and learning then we can't we don't really know what we're walking into right and I, to your point if we're just changing for the sake of changing then we really we're not coming from an informed perspective and we can't always have um all the data we can't we're not always operating from a from a 100 percent clear this is this is how this is going to unfold perspective but we, I think it's really important to constantly be um, evaluating, exploring, learning what we can learn. And then also realizing that, especially if we're dealing with a, a, a large staff, that's where change really becomes very difficult. Because to your point, we're going to have folks that are really excited for the change. And we're going to have folks that are like really struggling with the change. And we're going to have some folks that are actively opposing it. And so how do we navigate, what's the strategy of what, how we're going to lean into that and how are we inviting conversations to really hear from folks to understand what's blocking it? And I'll say the number one thing we run into is, is identity. People, uh, identities are at stake when we, when we are moving through quite a lot of change. What, what do you mean by that? Identity is so, at stake. I, yeah, I'm not... yeah. So imagine that, um, let's see. Let's say AI is like all in the news these days, right? And so that's an easy one to, to capture some fears because it's still quite uncertain for a lot of us, right? And so if you thought, if you think about, oh, let, we're going to introduce some AI capabilities into this new software suite that's going to um, basically automate all audits. Well, if you're an auditor, then your sense of identity is in question. Because what does it mean to be an auditor in, in the world where we've got software that automatically does it mm. for us, right? But the, but the thing is, is we have to under, we have to unpack it and say, what does that mean? We have to have that conversation, that dialogue, and explore that future. And the people that are eager for the change probably see it. They probably can't articulate it. They certainly haven't visualized it. And we can we create moments where people can come together and the people that are excited for the change 
can slow down enough to like have and provide ways for them to communicate to the others. So they start to see it and go, Oh, wait a second. I can reimagine who I am. And it's a transformation they have to go through, right? Because that you can't just flip a switch and have them go from I'm an auditor to I'm a X, Y, Z, or I'm a, I'm a on-prem engineer. And now I'm a cloud engineer. You know, there's like, it's just a totally different mindset shift that people have to learn about and reimagine and rethink who they are. Are you interested in offering virtual CFO services at your firm or scaling your existing service offerings? The Virtual CFO Playbook, How to Land $60,000 a Year Clients and Provide a Killer Client Experience, is an online series of modules that will equip you with essential tools for creating and delivering scalable VCFO services. These approaches have helped Summit CPA grow from $500,000 to upwards of $5 million in revenue over the past decade. If you're ready to grow your firm, visit summitcpa.net slash VCFO playbook to enroll now. So you, you talked about the, the learning and then obviously with what you just mentioned, um, how do you find that line of what when to do that learning? You know, so I think whenever you're making a change, there's kind of two directions you can go. You can go of, okay, we're going to include everybody in the company in this decision and we're going to talk about it and we're going to do everything and we're going to spend months making sure this is the right decision. Or you can just make the decision and say, deal with it, people. So I, I guess what's the what's the fine <laughs> line between those between those two and how do you determine what's the right amount of people to pull, bring in ahead of time to make sure that the change is right? You know, I, personally, it, I, I'm a big fan of creating a culture where everyone's curious. So we we get people to the point where they're constantly asking themselves, hey, how can this be better? Or is this serving us? The, the worst is when we, we have processes that are so mature and so established that we're, we hold them sacred and we won't let, let go of them. But, but at, at the end of the day, they're, they're not serving their function anymore, right? They're actually a disservice. They're <laughs> slowing us down. They're, they're just there for the, you know, it's, it reminds me of the, the movie Office Space where it's like the TPS report, right? It's <laughs> like, what, do, what, do, where do, what are these TPS reports we have floating around our companies that we, that we could kind of creatively destruct? And I think that if we breed a culture of curiosity, everyone's constantly having those conversations. So it doesn't create this moment of like, oh my gosh, we really, we had to bring everyone in and do a giant survey. I don't believe those pulse surveys work. I think it has to be a continuous healthy habit of being curious and learning and creating those opportunities to flex. Um, and that gets into other cultural things where, you know, if we, if everyone's overloaded, where they're running at the max, then there's no slack in the system for them to thrive and innovate and think, think in these ways. Um, and, uh, and, you know, definitely on the spectrum of like, hey, this is the change we need and you're going to have to go deal with it. So like, <laughs> hey, let's just constantly be changing all the time. Or like, um, I, think, I think if we just create, um, if we find ourselves in the middle where we created a, um, a culture where change can kind of emerge and people can are allowed to create local solutions to their problems, and then we can we can we can double down on the things that are working. Uh, it's like okay, look what Susan did over here. This is really cool. This is a great prototype of what how we might do it. But now when we pick this up and look at it over in this other department, or we think about how it might work with if we start doing this for this client or that client, then we might have to. Um, we might have to change it or adapt it or evolve it. And so that's when we bring in other people to, th to, to the conversation and kind of percolate it out. So, you, so basically it sounds like yeah, you want to go from a small group outward then is, is kind of is, is what I'm hearing. If you get too big of a group, then everybody's, kind of, you know, everybody's just kind of numb to that change or numb to making a, making a decision or numb to you know, delaying it because of whatever reason. Whereas a, small, a very small group, you can decide what you want to do and then you want to then – uh, broadcast that change amongst everyone else, but then giving them the option or autonomy to actually make minor changes to that as, as their department needs or their department wants. Is that, is that what? I'm yeah, I think, I think what, ha what happens is you have a bottoms up and a top down, um, um, I would say symbiotic relationship, right? Cause if leadership isn't um, supporting from a structural standpoint and from a resource standpoint, and from a, even just like a cultural mindset point, like these like little, these grassroots movements can't happen, mm -hmm. right? But if we try to just command everything and puppet everything from the top, that's not going to work either. 
So I think what we have to do is think about it like this. Leadership should think of themselves as gardeners. Right? I can't make that plant grow, but I can create the conditions by which the plants will thrive. And the, thrive, the plants have to find their local uh, optimizations, right? Like if the sun's not quite shining where they need it, and the plant starts to grow toward the sun, right? Like it's it locally modified and adapted. And then, um, and the, you know, that's how, that's how these systems evolve, right? But we have to tend and we have to, as leaders, provide those conditions and, uh, to allow them to do those things. I think it's a great point because I think it, it goes back to action, right? Like I, I think a lot of companies and a lot of businesses and a lot of leaders like say, this is who I am, but it's like saying I'm a gardener, but I've never actually planted a plant in my life, right? So I think that <laughs> if you want to have that culture of, okay, we're going to be curious and we want everybody to bring ideas to us, yet every time someone brings an idea to you, you shut it down and all ideas come from you, then it's never going to work. So I think that you really have to to live out that core value if that's what you're going to, if that's what you're going to do is like, you know, hey, this idea was brought to us by... Um, by Bob, who's just who's a web designer, and he had brought this idea of a process improvement. Let's go down this path, and this is what we're going to do going forward. And I think that as long as you're embracing it, that it, it naturally comes because people are like, "Hey, if Bob brought that idea, maybe next time I bring an idea to to leadership, they're going to let me do it as well." And so I think it really is about action, and not just saying, "Hey, I'm a gardener." You know, you have to actually yeah. give it out. So I think there's two things there too, which is um, really examining where ideas go to die in your organization. Like, how are they getting squished? Some people talk about the frozen middle, or you just mentioned leadership shooting down the idea. Like, where does it happen? <clears throat> and then how can we put in, how can we um, have an intervention where we say, let's uh, prevent that from happening? Because we can't just bring in best practices from elsewhere. We had to look at, like, where it's breaking down for us organizationally. Uh, and it's also easy to repeat a mantra where we're like, we're going to let ideas flourish. It's like, okay, great. But if we don't go in and examine and it's like what Drucker used to say, what gets measured gets managed, right? And so if we don't measure where the ideas are getting stifled, we have no chance of fixing it, right? Because we had to understand that point. Hmm. So, so what, what about what about for the person like myself, where I, I, well, I'll come to the table with a lot of, like, lot of different ideas. And, you know, I'll go to a meeting or I'll go to a conference and I'll hear these great, you know, three different things or four different ideas that we want to, I'd, I'd want to implement right away into the, into the company. And then when I come back to the meeting and I talk about it, you know, then of course they get shot down or they get, you know, stifled in some manner. Um, great ideas, but they, they don't get any further than that. You know, at what, at what point should a leader continue to push for that change or for those new ideas or what, at what point should they say, you know, Hey, this is not, uh, the right timing or the not, not the right place or not even a good idea. How, how does that, how, how, how should that process actually? Yeah. So in that case, if I understand it correctly, it's like the leaders at a conference and the leaders bring in an idea that, that we heard. And, you know, I think and nobody else if, if the leaders right? experience, nobody's heard about the idea, right? So yeah. when, you, when you, when you bring it in, yeah. the leader has been thinking about it for, three, four days, how great this is. Heard everybody else talk about how great this is. Brings this idea to the table and then gets shot down left and right for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. You know, there, 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 there's a number of things that might be at work there. Um, one is, again, if we built a culture around kind of protecting the way things are done and we haven't built a culture of curiosity and creating a, a space of the safety to experiment, then then that's a cultural, it's like the antibodies of the organization are coming in. And it's less about those people and how they really, really feel deep down. And it's more around they're kind of playing the roles that we kind of taught them to play. They've been conditioned to respond that way. And so part of so sometimes you have to have the conversations to break that down. And I think as a leader, it something to experiment with is when you bring these things in, if they are getting shut down, like really drilling into like really what the opposition's about and mm -hmm. also say, Hey, here's the other thing. I've really loved to like treat everything like a prototype because if we come in and we say, Oh, this is the best idea possible. And we got a culture where people are used to shooting down things. They're like, Oh, they're like, oh, target, you know, <laughs> right. they're like, oh, I'm, they're ready. Right. They're like, Oh, here, here's a new, here's an incoming, you know? And, and so if you come in with the humility of like, I'm not sure about this. It sounded interesting, but there might be something good here. Can you help me figure out what's good about this? 
or like what we could what we could learn from it. Then it frames it of like, we should do this. And then now they're like, oh man, we're going to have to change everything. This is going to be a pain in the butt. But like it shifts the perspective around encouraging them to think, to pull out the good bits. Like, what do they like about it? And then go, okay, well, based on what you like about it, what could we start doing? So instead of importing something from somewhere else, it's like take trying to take cherry pick the good bits. And then the other thing that I'll say too, and this, this applies to both the both scenarios where we were talking about before, um, and, and what you're mentioning here is, uh, r- small risky bets can be really powerful because when a bet is so big, that's when, that's when the antibodies really come out, right? Mm-hmm. Like imagine you, you, you know, you don't have a strong of immune system if you, if you, uh, s- bet, scuff your, your, your knuckle, right. And it doesn't bleed. But like you get a gash that requires stitches, like, you know, there's a big response. There's a lot of swelling. There's a big reaction. And so organizations are, are very similar, right? They're going to they're gonna react based on the threat, how big the threat is. And so if we, if we minimize that threat and um, we make, if we make it small enough, the potential risk is much smaller, right? Because that blast radius, that potential damage is c- contained, but let's make it really, really risky. Because the riskier it is, the more we can learn. So anytime we're doing a little experiment or test or trying something new, let's actually like actually swing for the fences. But let's do it in a way that's not going to like damage the business in a big way. Like we can undo it if we if if it make, if we make a mistake. Yeah, I think it's a that's a really great point because yeah, I think a lot of, like you said, everybody every idea doesn't have to be a home run, right? Like some, sometimes the small little change will really make a big difference. Um, so I'm gonna piggyback off Jody's question a little bit here because I think uh, Jody and I experienced some of the same things, and I can tell with his question is is I think when I so when I started at Summit, we were probably 20, 25 employees, and so a lot of the ideas were coming from you know a couple of the CFOs, Jody, Adam, and I, and like we were just generating a lot of the change. And I think as we've gotten larger, and now we're part of an even larger firm in the last you know six months or so I think that the, one of the obstacles to this is, you know, I'll bring a change in and I'll be like, Hey, this, this is what we should do. And you don't realize that 50 other changes are already happening because we've built a culture. Like you said, like, okay, we're not the only ones bringing ideas and changes anymore. So can you talk a little bit about how change management needs to change as the company gets larger? Yeah, for sure. So I think one thing that you, one thing you're speaking about is just kind of maintaining your portfolio of change right and so exactly like, however you want to track it you know everyone has uh different um project management tools mm-hmm. and depending on the and this may vary across the organization you know if like agencies are, are a special breed because in an agency no matter how, like everyone's kind of even as you grow and get really really huge pretty much everyone's of the same ilk right but you go and look Mm -hmm. at like a i don't know like a software company or cpg or something there's so many different departments and roles that get quite quite big right Mm -hmm. and a lot of times those departments will um will have their own mechanisms for project management or their own little tools or sometimes it's like not not even a very good tool like it might be email (laughs) or something like and so and so it's you I think listening to some of your peers around how they're doing it can be really powerful because we might already have licenses to see like some t- project management tool, whether it's Asana, Trello or whatever. But I, I think tracking those things. So it, we at least, I, I love this. Um, you know, I mentioned Drucker's um, what gets measured gets managed. And I, 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 I have a similar saying that what gets visualized gets velocity. And so anytime we can see progress, that begets mm-hmm. more progress, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's one of the things great project management tools can do is really kind of surface up the project. And so I don't really care what tool it is as long as we can visualize what's happening really quickly. And so I'm a big fan of like um, whenever some, whenever tools have like a Kanban view where you can kind of visually see the arc of progress, really powerful mm-hmm. because that tells us if we've got too much work in progress. And so I, yep. I would say like in any of the, in ch- any of this kind of change management work should be treated um, with, with the, with lean methodology kind of mindset. So if we got too much work in progress, it can grind stuff to a halt because, Hey, we just overloaded everything. And so, and that's something you had to experiment with around what is the right amount to have in progress uh, as far as what's healthy. But when you get there and you've got too much, 
like you can feel it, right? And and if you've got a way to visualize it, then you can kind of it helps quantify it, it helps see it, and you can kind of back off that edge a little bit. The one the one thing we've done in that area is not only have we measured it, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we are a very change company. We love change. We think about change. We're always trying to change. And so one of the things that we did, probably when we were what, around 30, 35 people, Jody's, we actually hired project managers um, mm. because of that. Like, again, it was, we needed more than just a tool of let's put all our changes into this tool and everybody watch them. We needed someone to actually watch it and someone who's really good at project management to be able to push back at us. Because like I said, Jody and I just love change. I'm like, hey, we should do this. And we need someone that had that project management in mind be like, yeah, we can do that. But just so you know, it's like 15th on the list of all the projects we're working on. And so if you want to move it up, some of these other projects are going to have to stop. And so that's one thing that we've done, which again, I, I doubt there's very many CPA firms out there that have project management. This is something we had to do in order to really get our hands around that, um, that, that change management that you mentioned. Yeah, I'll say this, you know, this, this is an old agile um, adage that um, that's, came out of QA, and it, and it was this idea that if everybody owns quality, nobody owns it, because <laughs> there were organizations that didn't have QA staff, right? And they were just saying, "Oh, well, everyone should be responsible for quality because we care about quality." But at the end of the end of the day, to your point, if everyone's like ultimately responsible for it, and it's and we're just looking at this tool. Who's going to be sweating the details? Who's going to be staring at it, making sure it's accurate, and noticing things? Um, and so, whether it's um, whether it's in a formal title of project manager, or if it's just people that are identified, because um, I think whether or not you um, own the role, someone needs to embody the role to like really be to be identified as the go to person to to get questions a- answered and to, to kind of steward that progress. 100% agree with that. I think um, creating systems and so forth is the same thing. When you're when you're creating systems, you have to do the same thing. Everybody can everybody can write down everything that they do and map everything out in detail, but you really need somebody that is going to be the person that's in charge of that. You know, someone taking that that lead. You know, being the person that's overseeing it, pushing it, making sure that it's all consistent. You know, across the board. And uh, you know, without that, you, you'll never create your systems processes you'll never you'll never systemize everything to where you need to be so i think that's all part of the the change management is having somebody focused and responsible for it you know somebody that's leading it i 100 percent you brought up a pet word of mine which is systems uh <laughs> big big fan of systems thinking and you know and any and anyone who's a fan of complexity theory has already noticed that i've been kind of pointing out a few different um, complexity theory things, but in systems and, and funny enough, that's where I got the name of vulture control because um, I have a massive modular synthesizer. And back when I was a chief technology officer, um, I would often remark on how patching up my synthesizer was a, a lot like working with teams, because if I were to make, if I just move one little cable or turn one little knob, it can have a ripple effect throughout the whole organization, you know, and it reverberates back and forth. And it's like, oh, wow, that was a massive, that little tweak had a massive impact. And that's the way systems work, right? And we have to, we have to really respect that, the, these phenomenons. And so it requires a, a bit of care and a bit of understanding. Um, and we, uh, and we, we shouldn't take those things for light, lightly. And, you know, I, we have this, um, diagram we like to show in our facilitation training which depicts the amount of um, connections between people the more and more people you add into a meeting hmm. but this also applies to organizations right you've got two people there's one connection you got three people there's three connections you got four people there's um you know the connections are just exponentially increasing right <laughs> until until it gets quite, uh, unmanageable right and so how do you measure and understand these uh, these network dynamics as well as all the other impacts of the systems that are at play. And I think um, we won't always get it right, you know, we can't always afford. I mean, if you're going to hire someone like um, Peter Gray from UVA to come in and do a massive network analysis, you know, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, even for like a medium-sized business. You're not going to do that for every change, right? But I think being aware that these things have impacts and staying curious, we won't always get it right, but but being aware of it's huge because when, when something doesn't respond as we expected it, we, we're not apt to blame people or, or, you know, or, or just be frustrated. We're like, Oh, okay. The system responded in a way that it was unexpected. Let me try this instead. 
And so that's kind of like um, in a complex in complexity theory, we talk about probing the environment and seeing what how it responds. And so it's like I think that's a, a good mental model to, to carry into these situations. I think that's really good too. I think, and you know, you kind of talked about the network connections. I think what I, what I think about there is, is, you know, when I think about my team is when we do a change and obviously someone's going through a pretty big change now with the, with the merger we're doing, but it's, it's, I can't talk to every senior accountant to see how they're feeling. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I could, but it would take a little bit more time. So like what I need to know as a leader is who is going to have the best understanding of how the senior accounts are feeling about this who's gonna have the best understanding of how the cfos are feeling about this who's gonna have the best understanding of where the cfos are feeling about or the the auditors are feeling about this so i could just go to three people as opposed to trying to go to 100 people so i think really understanding how those network connections work helps you understand change and, and really get the picture of what's going on because i have no clue because i'm not doing the work of what this means for our senior accountants right i don't know what a senior accountant's day looks like now that we're merged with Anders versus what it looked like six months ago. But if I went to the accounting trainers who works with them every day and asked them how it's changed and just talked to one or two of them, they might be able to give me the right picture of, okay, this is, this has changed them a lot more than you think, Jamie, or actually this hasn't changed them at all. You know, you kind of think understanding those network connections is really important to be an effective leader. Yeah. There's also an interesting phenomenon too, right? Because when you, those three people you mentioned that are kind of your go-to kind of sources of truth there, are interesting nodes in that network that other people Mm -hmm. can be aware of that, okay, Jamie relies on these three people. So they have influence, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's really powerful for everyone to be aware of that and to know it. And, and so, and that may not be reflected in the org chart and it it may be, but often these informal Mm -hmm. pathways of information aren't, you know, and I think it's really interesting to explore those and it can be powerful to explore them as a team. Right. If we're thinking about um, embarking on a change, doing some uh, we don't have to go heavy duty network analysis, but doing some lightweight weight analysis around who's in, who will be impacted by this change or almost like um, racy kind of stuff, like who's responsible, accountable, you know, all these kinds of things. But who are the people in the mix? And then also, who who do I work with often? Who do I know the least? Who has the most influence? These kinds of things kind of adding these layers of thinking around the people can really kind of shift how we, how we might lean into the conversations or, or any of our next steps. And we, in fact, we made a template that's free for folks to download, which is um, a, 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 for the express purpose of helping people have those little quick snapshots of their networks. So I'll, I'll send you a copy of that in case you want to share it around. Oh, yeah, I'd love so to how do you, how do you announce that to the team without, without announcing it? I mean, or, or do you just simply announce to the team, you know, Hey, these are the three people. If you have any questions, come to them. Don't come to me. You know, well, you obviously don't do that. Right. Or how, how do you, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I think it's going to depend a lot on the culture and a lot on the types of information you're gleaning from folks. I think it'd be interesting to hear. I'd love to hear from Jamie on how he approached it. Um, but my, my thought would, would be, it can be helpful just to have some informal, like maybe making those three people aware of it. Hey, I'm, I'm you, I'm leaning on you in this capacity. So in your relationships with everyone else, you know, letting them know that you're a resource that they can come to could be powerful. So that way it kind of spreads organically, but I'm curious, Jamie, what did you found to be successful in your conversations? No, I think that that's exactly it is, is having the relationship with those people and them, them knowing that, and not just for that one change, but for any change, they, they know that they're my eyes and ears when it comes to that certain group of people and, and then them knowing it. And I think that, like you said, I think the word used was nodes. Like, I think people understand that, like, you know, if there's lots of different people that I'm using for those, for those things, but those are the people that are going to hear, I'm going to listen to because I have meetings with them. Like I have three meetings every week with, um, three different groups of people. And those are the people I'm spending the time with to get that information. And that's the purpose of that meetings. And so I think the fact that they know that's the purpose of that meeting, they flow that information down to their group, right? So like we already talked about the trainers. I meet with the trainers for an hour every week. And that's the whole purpose of the meeting is to get the feel of the accounting team, to get the feel of the accounting processes, to get the feel of what's going on within the accounting group. So they know that that's the purpose of that meeting. And so they're going to, prior to that meeting, they're going to want to come prepared. So they're going to talk to people. They're going to, you know, go out and reach out to people and be like, Hey, I haven't talked to this accountant for a while. Let's go see how they're doing and see if they have any information I can bring to Jamie next Wednesday when that meeting happens. So that's exactly what you said. That's how I approached it. Yeah. So I mean, kind of, kind of switching gears a little bit with, um, with change itself, we've got the, uh, economic conditions aren't, aren't the best right now. I think we can all agree upon that. 
and there's going to be a lot of change coming coming down the uh, down the road here. It could be a short term, it could be a long term. You know, Douglas, how, how do you how do you deal with this change, or how do you convey this in, this information to your team without really getting them overly overly excited or have high anxiety with it? Mm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. As as a leader, I've found that transparency is really important. But we also don't want to to obsess over, you know, things to the point where, you know, it's distracting um, and debilitating for folks. And I think to me, it's it's a matter of understanding uh, each individual, you know, and what their thresholds are and what their strengths are and leaning into their strengths and say, like, for instance, you know, if um, if someone is. Uh, is really strong in the kind of uh, uh, as an arranger, I might say, Hey, this is, this is the way things are right now. This is the situation we're in. And I think your skills could be uh, really helpful uh, to help us navigate these next steps in, in X, Y, or Z ways. So, um, you know, as an arranger, you might be able to help us put these pieces in place. And so um, to me, it's, it's always about like, hey, what, what what resources do we have? What how can we re- reuse our relationships and really lean in together to to make the best of the situation we're in? And then you know, uh, and then also, I mean, f- fact of the matter is, there's uh, there's already companies that have had to make layoffs. There will be companies making layoffs, and I think the thing the thing there is always 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 always. How do we lean into that with humility, with humanity and grace? Um, you know, we've we've definitely seen folks on the news that that uh, have done that poorly, and you know, um, I think really just being there for people in a time that's super um, difficult and and emotional, and how do we support them? Um, even if, because uh, the other thing we have to keep in mind is, you know that might be a move that a company has to make and uh, it might be scary as the people left because it's like, wow, we got a big hill to climb here. Um, But taking care of those people and putting relationships first is going to help out more than anything. So it's not about like cutting it loose and then just like, okay, what, how do we fix How do we just keep, keep on it? Like taking taking the uh, requisite amount of time to to make sure they're taken care of, um, and that the the team that's that anyone that's left there is also heard and taken care of because that's going to be a big change for them. You know, like I often tell people, some it, sometimes it's worse to be the person who's left behind because you're now doing two or three people's jobs, and so you know yeah. that's a that's an important conversation to have and to say how do we how do we who are still here and lean in together and, and, and navigate this. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the other thing too, aside from, even if companies aren't at that point having to deal with that, there's still so much uncertainty um, that we're, we're, we're leaning into right now. And I just, I think it's important to, to have those conversations. And cause I think the, the, the age of the super strong leader that has it all figured out is, is over and we had to come in with with curiosity. We had to include, like, um, ask people to bring their best selves. And hey, what are you noticing? What do you think we could do? And um, and and at that point, we're in it together. It's not just like I'm, you know, I'm I'm not the victim of someone making weird decisions, <laughs> right? And so even if we got it wrong, we got it wrong together. And I think you get a lot more. Um, you get a lot more resiliency on the team. I think the, you know, I've been a CFO consultant now for both a recession <laughs> and a, uh, and a COVID <laughs> scare. I think what, what we really learned, what we really learned during that time is, is be prepared. You know, I think that's, you know, we spent a lot of time when COVID hit was sitting down with our clients and being like, okay, let's talk 
best case scenario, worst yep. case scenario, and let's just plop something in the middle there. And then let's have let's have decisions for all three scenarios. Okay. So if if it's best case scenario, awesome, nothing changes. If it's worst case scenario, we're gonna have to get rid of five people. What are, what are the five people that make the most sense? Or maybe we can get rid of three people and stop using this program. Or yep. let's let's come up with what that worst case scenario is. And then in the middle, what happens there? And then you you're ready for when you see those scenarios and you have those trigger points, right? So if we have let's just say we have three months in a row of three hundred thousand dollars of revenue, guess what? That's the worst case scenario for us. We're gonna need to take that take that step and so you're ready to take that step and i think the other the other part that i think goes with that is not only having leadership be prepared but having your team be aware and that's something that needs to start now right like if you've never shown your company your financial statements and they have no clue how the company does then they're in the dark right where if they actually see that every month and they say oh this is what it looks like when we're operating good and they can start to see the downward trends and you can say hey we're going down right now we're gonna have to start thinking about things we can do in order to keep this business going or things are going great i know the economy is bad but guess what we're still doing really well and so i think information is power and so i think having those conversations with your team and not just your leadership is, is really important from what i've seen from consulting with companies on the finance side of things 100 i love the the um you know everything's good everything's bad everything's great or you know or bad worse worse <laughs> worstest you know like these different scenarios are really powerful and you know, I've always been a fan of, you know, ever since my early days in startups, you know, having models where we've got levers that we can go, okay, uncheck these things off, flip this on or off and look at this. And it's like, oh man, this is not looking good. What are we going to do? And there's, there's actually a tool that I'm a big fan of called critical uncertainties. And it's, um, unfortunately it's a two by two. So, you know, not all, not all consulting tools are, are two by twos, but quite a, quite a few of them are. So, um, but the, um, the way this works is you, you think about things that are both critical for the outcome. So what we're talking about now is the finances, right? Like how much revenue can we generate? And then also maybe our ability to control costs would be, would be two of them. Right. And so you'd say, Mm -hmm. we're able to tightly control our costs. We're not able to tightly control our costs. We have a lot of revenue. We have a little revenue and we basically can, create that creates four quadrants right and so we look at those combinations and think mm -hmm. what would we do in those scenarios but the the beauty of the tool is like you can dream up all sorts of things that are critical that we don't know the outcome of that that's about to happen on the horizon and we can kind of peer into those intersections and say what might we do um if if this combination of scenarios were to were to happen and and if you take it a step further and you look across the different quadrants of where you came up with the strategies that might you might um, deploy if those things were to come to fruition, you can look across them and say, what did I put, what things are similar across all of them? Then those are our robust strategies, mm -hmm. right? We want to do those regardless. And then there might be things that you're like, man, that's a really good one. And that's worth doing, even if this doesn't happen, right? Like we should, that's a hedging strategy. Let's do that regardless. And I think that not enough um, conversation is spent on these kind of exploring these kind of hypothetical things that might happen around the corner. I mean, sure, we talk about them of like, hey, what if this happens? And there's dialogue around it. This tool is a great way to kind of codify it down into like, okay, if A and B or B and C or D and E, you know, you're kind of like comparing these different potential outcomes and what might we do can really help people rationalize about these future states. No, I, I love that because again, data is really important, right? Data helps you make a, an irrational decision into a rational decision. You know, you're, you're making a decision based on what your gut feeling is, which is, you know, good or bad versus what the data actually is showing you. And that, I think that's what uh, I think, Adding, adding the data, adding the information, breaking them into the four quadrants, I, I think is the perfect way of going about it. And, and I think it has to be done very on a frequent basis. It shouldn't be done just once a, once a quarter, once a month. I think it should be done pretty much on a regular basis. You know, hey, what happens if this happens? You know, you're, you're constantly looking at that information and constantly making those decisions. And like you said, you might you may come up with a uh, – a solution that would be great now versus waiting until that the, the situation actually happens. I, I, I think that's the, that's the power of having someone sitting next beside you and, and really kind of guiding you and helping you make those, uh, those real informed decisions. 
But I also think there's there's comfort in the information, right? So like I think a lot of times that people go into this being like, oh no, we're gonna have a recession and right. thoughts go to I'm gonna have yes. to lay off half my employees, or we're gonna have to shut down three locations where once you actually do the modeling out, you're like, okay, worst case scenario, we're gonna have to get rid of three people. You know, I think it, it, a lot of times when you see the actual data, it's not as bad as you think. And that's again, that was so so evident during COVID. Like uh, nine times out of ten, like we were either in the better tier or the middle tier. And I think a lot of companies like when the word COVID started to become popular, companies were freaked out. They're like, what does this mean? What is this? How much revenue are we going to lose? How many people are we going to have to lose? Once you actually did the math, it wasn't that bad. So um, with that said, we're we're right at time here. So I'm going to give uh, both the um, podcasters here a chance for a final thought. So I'll, I'll start with you, Douglas. Final thoughts for our listeners. Yeah, I think that thing you just ended on is really powerful. You know, we have to have models for change. And, and that point I made earlier around visualizing what's happening. Because you know, we've got those folks that are eager for change, those people that are worried about change, and um, maybe the people that are just freaked out and they don't know what to think. And so the more we can model the outcomes, understand where we're heading, like paint that picture of that roadmap, the more clarity we can get, the, the more um, that can reduce fears and uncertainty. And we can get on a level playing field and have a real solid conversation around what it is. So, um, so I think that's really key is how do we model the change? Yeah, Douglas, if, how do we, how, how, do, how is someone going to get a hold Jody. of you? I mean, you've talked a lot about change and I think everybody really needs a you on their team in, in some manner. Um, how do they, how do they reach out to you at all and how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, I, they can find Vulture Control at vulturecontrol.com. And I'm really active on LinkedIn. If people want to check me out there, uh, you know, I post all my blogs and my, um, my podcast there and, uh, yeah. And hopefully we can, we can share that template and some other resources in the, in the show notes as well. Yeah. This has been great, Douglas. I mean, we've, you know, I, I've, from the very beginning change has been something that, uh, I, I think is super important for a company and it, it, if companies don't change over time, they, they go stagnant. And I think, uh, what you brought to light is, is, is just a big part of that. You know, you've got to be constantly looking, uh, for the right change, and then you've got to be able to bring that change to the to the team in a manner that uh, they can then take that take the ball and run with it. Really, I mean, you, you don't want to be a scared of change, you know, and you just want to be able to embrace it. And I think uh, that's what you've uh, at least that's what I've heard from you. And I hope I'm not uh, putting words in your mouth there, but I think that's uh, so important for an organization to uh, to embrace change like uh, like you've done in really all facets of the company. Great. Well, definitely appreciate Jody. Appreciate Douglas. Um, I think this is a great show. I know I learned a lot and excited to um, go talk to some of my companies and say, hey, don't don't be afraid of change. Let's, yeah, let's, thank let's you. do this. So appreciate you guys. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving modern CPA firm success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.